tools, and in particular, algorithmic tools for sampling, learning, optimization, and data analysis, high dimensional geometry, randomized linear algebra, and computing for good. Um, he has many awards, including being a fellow of the AMS, the American Mathematical Society, ACM fellow, um, Sloan Research Fellow, um, formerly was a Miller Fellow more than 20 years ago here at UC Berkeley. Um, and uh, let me not, I can go on and on about awards. So let's just stop here and I'll hand it off to Santos for the talk. Thank you, Santos. Thank you. Not much uh, Welsh in this talk, but there will be some more, uh, 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 th there will be a lot of randomness. Um, so here's the, I, I have only 26 slides, which is the fewer than the number of minutes I have. So hopefully this will be on time. Um, so here are the two problems, minimize a function. Let's think of Euclidean space. We'll see something more general very soon. Uh, and uh, generate points from a distribution whose density is proportional to e to the minus some function of x. Okay, those are the two problems. Uh, so before Simons, in fact, in the 20th century, we had uh, great results. Uh, optimization can be solved to polynomial time, uh, logarithmic in the desired accuracy, polynomial in the dimension for arbitrary convex uh, functions. Um, and also, uh, you can sample, basically, if f is convex, uh, you can sample e to the minus f uh, with in, in polynomial time, approximately. Great, right? So the polynomial time setting in some sense, at least for convex uh, problems was understood. Now these problems don't really have any reason to be associated, right? You're optimizing, you're finding one point, the extreme in some direction, and then sampling, you're kind of getting a distribution. Uh, except there is this one result which says that convex minimization can be done by a polynomial time reduction to sampling. So you can reduce one to the other. Not quite the other way around, but you can do it in this direction. Okay, so uh, let's go forward a little bit and uh, see, so more, see more precisely what, the, what, these, uh, what these bounds are. So for optimization, the general convex optimization problem, the, the way you present it is how do, you, how do I get this function? Or the, you know, we, so um, you get it through an oracle, either a separation oracle or a membership oracle. And in either case, so in the case of a separation oracle, with uh, n calls to the separation oracle and poly n additional time, you can solve the problem. So the way this would work is um, basically you maintain a set of possible points where the solution might lie. And then uh, you try to query a good point so that no matter what the separation oracle gives you, you're able to reduce the set of candidates by a constant factor. So that's what you can do with the cutting plane method. The ellipsoid algorithm was weaker. It was cutting it down by a one minus one over n factor, but uh, you can actually cut down by a constant factor. So it takes you order n iterations to, to zoom in. Uh, with a membership oracle, it takes a little bit longer. It takes poly n calls because you don't get this benefit of telling you that, oh, your solution is on this side of a hyperplane. You just are told, no, this is not it. You're not you're in or out. You get a yes or no answer. Okay, so in September 2013, uh, this guy at the first Simons program, this young graduate student walked into my office and asked me, started asking me questions about convex geometry and telling me these things. Indeed, uh, 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 a couple of years later, uh, they had this uh, improved result on this classical problem still maintain the n calls to the separation oracle, but you need only n cube total time. This is the state of the art. It was very much done here, Simons. Uh, and uh, uh, in a couple of years later, we also got a, uh, what's the current best. So n is the best possible. You can prove information theoretically. You can't do better than that. Uh, simple proof. And uh, n squared is what you need with a membership oracle. Again, it's poly time but we don't know if it's the best possible. So here's open problem number one. Can you do convex optimization with fewer than n squared uh, membership oracle calls? It's an oracle model, right? So there's no issue of Turing machines or, yeah. Okay, sampling, um, you know, 20th century, 21st century. So the algorithms are, are, are even simpler. Um, you have basically a Markov chain, a random walk. One of the simplest ones is, uh, at a current point, you consider a little ball around the current point of a fixed radius delta. You uh, try to go there. If the point is still in the set you're trying to sample from, you go, otherwise you try again. If you're trying to sample from a distribution then you look at the function values where you are and where you're trying to go, look at their ratio and that tells you with what probability you should accept. Which is right, distribution, the, the metropolis filter. 
Okay, and so Kannan, Lovas, and Shimano has proved that n to the five queries, you know, these, these in or out or function value queries suffice for the first sample and n cube for later samples. They already proved this in 97. The first one takes longer time because you need to do a lot of setup, but then after that, it's n cube. Uh, and then they made a conjecture that, say, that, that would imply, and this is the, the, the entire motivation of the conjecture, that n squared suffices for later samples. Same algorithm, just the analysis uh, it requires this geometric conjecture, which if true would imply n squared. Uh, later samples, uh, what does that mean? That means that you basically have a very good start. So you have, a, you have what's called a warm start. Your distribution is, with, is, is pretty close to what you want to sample from. So that's one. And the second one is that uh, the density is isotropic. So the covariance matrix is the identity. It's not arbitrarily skewed. OK, uh, that was in 97. Uh, just last year, um, we were able to improve this to n cube for the first sample. And uh, as of uh, last month, it turns out that the KLS conjecture is true up to log n to the five. And, uh, and this implies it's n square times log to the 10 n for later samples. I'm ignoring all log factors unless they depend on other parameters here. So, uh, so up to logs, which at this point maybe are not important, uh, uh, it's n squared for later samples. Okay. We'll, 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 this, this KL, the words KLS will keep coming up, but yeah, that, that's the picture. Now, question is, is this the best possible? Not for this algorithm, but in general. Again, we're in an Oracle model because we're asking membership queries. Is n squared the best possible for sampling, let's say, uh, it's open? Okay. Uh, now, there are two related problems that I'm only going to spend one slide on which are motivating and also help you uh, help those problems a lot. Uh, the first is volume. And the second is integration more generally, you want to integrate a given function. Uh, and so you can do these things in polynomial time. Uh, uh, volume of a well-rounded body, you can do in n cube steps. Uh, this happened post Simons. The rounding problem in case you haven't seen it before is just to find an affine transformation that makes your distribution have mean zero and covariance close to identity. Okay. And so uh, the result of this paper I mentioned last year is that the rounding itself can be done in n cube. And therefore, using the, the existing volume algorithm, everything is n cube. Is cubic the best possible for volume? Computation, not clear. Okay. okay, so why is it so slow? Why are we talking about these quadratic and cubic factors, right? Um, the, the bottleneck is the step size, both for in optimization and in, and in uh, sampling. It's like, how big a step can you take? So in the, in the sampling case, it's how large of a ball can you use to make your next steps? And the problem is that you're kind of forced to take a ball whose radius is not too large. Let me see, pen, okay. Um, so basically, if you had a cube, um, <laughs> yeah, right. And um, you know how if you take a ball, a point somewhere near the boundary, and you consider a ball around it, right? Well, most of it is outside. You'll be spending all your time on wasted calls. So you have to make your ball about one over root n, and then for most points, you will spend constant fraction of the time actually going to a new point. Okay. So so that's the bottleneck. One over root n. Is, so you've got to take these tiny steps, and your diameter is root n. So ends up taking n squared even for a cube. And n squared is the bound for all bodies now. Okay. So, um, so then you could say, you know, why don't we take deep, you know, bigger steps when you're deeper and smaller steps when you're closer? I mean, you know, pretty obvious, right? But if you try to do that, what will happen is that, okay, here, great, you have a big step, right? Oops. Um, okay. You know, yeah, you know, you, you will remember this, <laughs> like it or not. <laughs> so in the middle, oh, great, big step. Then you come here, you take a smaller step. And then you come here and you take a smaller step. What's going to happen to the distribution? It'll just go stick to the boundary. Okay, you don't get what you want. Okay. So can we use the local geometry in a more meaningful way, right? And this, this question will come up in both questions, both, both problems. And so let's go to optimization where this has been used very successfully for a long time. 
So what's the difficulty of optimization? I'm only talking about convex optimization. There's nothing uh, non-convex here. Is that, well, you have, let's say, let's say linear. You have this direction you want to minimize. So just go that way, right? Like, like gradient descent or gradient would tell you. Problem is you hit a hard constraint. And then when you hit a hard constraint, you kind of have to adapt. So you try to go along that you hit it again, again, and again, again. And that's what happens with something like simplex. You just you take too many steps. Right. Wouldn't it be nice if you could somehow do this continuously, right? Like you basically pretend you're a little ball and you're just rolling down towards this target and you just get there. Like something is, we should be able to do that. Right? Yeah. Okay. So um, that's the difficulty of optimization, these hard constraints, convex optimization. Smooth, strongly convex functions where you don't get these sharp boundaries, hard boundaries, are, is, are in fact much easier to optimize. Okay. And, you know, um, this is this Newton iteration, it's sort of, you know, um, um, uh, where, where, you, where you use the Hessian inverse times the gradient to take your step. If, 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 in case you've never seen this before, you know, if, you're, if you'll spend your life in the Boolean world, then, you know, all this is, I, I love it, but, you know, here is, here is the, you know, uh, we take a function, write down a degree two Taylor approximation, and then that's a quadratic, right? And then you ask, uh, what's the best step I can take? If I, if I knew this was my function. Well, you take the gradient, set it to zero, and you get that this is the best step you could take. So this, uh, this, is, this, is, this, was, this is the Newton iteration, right? Great. So, but this Hessian is crucial. How the gradient changes is crucial. I will use that to define your local geometry, right? So when you have a Hessian, it gives you the ability to define a local metric. Because the function is convex, it's always positive semi-definite, so this is a well-defined norm for every point. Great. So the interior point method, which uh, you know, uh, you, you'll see what I mean by why it's the same thing as designing designing a, a rink, is, is 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 the following idea. I hope the animation works. Let's see. Oops. Oh yeah, good. So, um, uh, so what we'll do is instead of minimizing your function f, which is convex but could be non-smooth. Let's add to it a, 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 what's called a barrier function, which is going to be very well behaved and, and smooth. It will do two things. First, it will blow up near the boundary. Okay. Um, ignore this for a second. Uh, so, so let's say that's your set. And what this function does is at a current point, it looks at the distances to the boundaries. And the simplest of the barriers, already in Kermarker's work, is uh, sum, sum up the negative logs of the distance. So as the distance goes close to zero, this goes off to infinity, okay? So, and you add this to your function. So it keeps you away from the boundary. If you're away from the boundary, it seems much better, right? So you don't have hit these hard constraints and you have to change course drastically. You could just keep going on a smooth path. So that's your function, that's what we'll do. Start with some T that's large, say one. That way you have a nice function. You can optimize it using just the neutron iteration. And then you gradually reduce the T uh, at, at this rate, one minus one over root nu, if you could do it at that rate, you would get root nu iterations up to log factors. But you need one more property. What is this new? What this new is capturing is, um, is, is the fact that the Hessian of your phi you know, is, is gonna define an ellipsoid for you, a little ellipsoid for you. Okay, it's, the, it's, it's, it's your local metric, so it has this ellipsoid, which, you can prove always lies completely inside the body, but, uh, but then the question is what scaling of it contains the symmetrization of the body around the point? I'll, I'll draw a figure for this in a second, but it's, it's, it's sort of measuring how, how, how well does the Hessian approximate the local geometry? Okay, um, we'll see it in a second, but so that's the key parameter here, new, how well does it approximate the local geometry? And, and you go at that rate one minus one over root nu. So this, this path of where you optimize this for each T is the central path. And so the function looks like this. It just blows up near the boundary and you want to design it so that the change is not too high, uh, but at the same time, um, you know, it's computable and efficient. Okay, so, the, so that, that, that's property one, how well it approximates locally. Property two is the fact that the Hessian should change slowly. So if you think for a second as the, of the local metric as say identity, so this is just, you're, you're looking at a ball, then this is saying that the change in any direction of the Hessian is bounded, is, 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 no, it's, it's, it's a Lipschitz function. 
it's growing as much as the length of the vector. Okay, so you should the Hessian shouldn't change too fast. That's that's the property you'd like. Okay, with these two properties at hand, you get spectacular results, and many of them in the last decade. Um, so this is I'm illustrating here what the what this uh, uh, capturing the local geometry means for current point x in the set. You look at the reflection of the set through the point. That's the two x minus k, and that's your ellipsoid. And a scaling of it contains contains the entire intersection. Okay, so how how so what functions can you can you uh, exist? You want to find good good barriers. So the one I already mentioned is the log barrier, and for that the parameter is m, the number of constraints. This is Kermarker's work, so it give you a square root m iterations. The universal barrier, which was introduced by Nestor and Nemirovsky, uh, actually has uh, only n. Doesn't matter how many constraints there are. You can define it for any convex body. It doesn't have to be a, lin a, a linear program or a polytope. And it's it's n. N is the best possible in general. And there are other barriers that give you n as well. However, computing them is actually uh, not it's not very efficient. Back then, they didn't even have an algorithm for computing the universal barrier because it involves computing the volume of a convex body. Now you can, but it would be a very slow way to do optimization. Okay, so something that happened. Much of the work here, right here at the, at the, at the Simons Institute, is that uh, Lee and Sidford uh, defined what's called a weighted log barrier, which uh, gets you uh, a, a parameter of O tilde n, so with a, with a log m factor, and uh, it's very fast. Okay, it's very fast, just as fast as the log barrier, and therefore you only need square root n iterations. This, this was an open problem in optimization for a long time, and it was solved very much by the TCS community in the Simon's environs. Now, here's the question. Can you do fewer than root n iterations? This is not just a question about optimization. This is really a complexity question. Can you solve linear programming? What's the parallel depth of solving linear programming? So we, we've heard this result that linear programming is uh, uh, p-complete, right? I mean, but what we're asking is, can you do linear programming with fewer than root n uh, parallel depth? You know, uh, uh, with smaller than root n parallel depth. Okay, and that's, that, that's open. Um, now, so that's the number of iterations, and each iteration is one linear system. Great. Okay, you're getting down a linear system. That's a problem we studied quite a bit. Uh, uh, however, in spite of the fact that it looks like root n linear systems, a surprising result, Cohen, Lee, and Song, about three years ago, is that linear programming can be solved actually in n to the omega time, just matrix multiplication time. You don't even need the root n times this. Now, matrix multiplication time shows up because that's the time to solve a single linear system. That's our current best time to solve a single linear system. Okay, so uh, even though you need to solve root n linear, linear systems, they're managing to do all of it in one, the time of one, up to logs, time of one linear system. How is this possible? And the, the main observation is that the solution to this linear system, it's, they're not completely different linear systems. They're all linear systems that you get by changing the constraints uh, that you're considering a little bit. They, you, you argue that the, the solution changes slowly and you only need to compute the significant changes and you can actually do that with an amortized dynamic data structure. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, and, and this has become a, a, a great field and so on. We already, we saw a, a, a talk about a breakthrough result yesterday about how this, this type of idea can be used to, to, to get max flow in nearly linear time, almost linear time. You, you know, for till, 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 till last year, I didn't know the difference between almost and nearly. How many people know the difference between almost and nearly? Okay, so let me explain to the rest of you. Almost means n to the one plus little o one. Nearly means n times polylog. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's a huge distinction in the world of uh, you know, fast algorithms. Okay, um, now, uh, so linear systems are the bottleneck now for optimization, at least for linear programs. So let's go to that and ask, it's a basic problem, right? We should know how to solve linear systems, but it's an open problem. We don't know how to solve them fast. We only know as fast as matrix multiplication, which is a great problem, but you know, it has its, has its whole set of complexities. Um, we, as far as we know, it could be n quadratic because the, certainly the representation size of the answer is quadratic. You don't need less than that. I mean, because you need n bits potentially for an n by n system. Uh, in fact, linear programming could be faster than matrix multiplication. Um, and so last year with Richard Peng, 
managed to show that at least for sparse linear systems, not, not, not terribly sparse, fewer than n to the omega minus one divided by log of the condition number non-zeros, you can solve it faster than matrix multiplication. And in fact, you can solve it faster than matrix multiplication, no matter how, how fast you make matrix multiplication, as long as it's more than two. So if, if okay, so if tomorrow, Virginia Williams tells me that it's uh, n to the 2.01, we can still solve linear systems faster, but <laughs> only for sparse enough. Okay, uh, so this is just an indication that there's something else out there that we haven't figured out yet, how to solve a linear system. Okay, so back to sampling. What is it, where does this show up in sampling? So how do we use local geometry for sampling, right? This, is, this was the key point. We were able to use local geometry to do optimization fast. Um, so instead of sampling from a ball, let's sample according to the local ellipsoid and then use a filter to make sure you get the right distribution. And indeed, Kanan and Narayanan uh, showed that this Dickin walk uh, mixes in uh, MN steps. And each step, you have to solve this uh, equivalent of a linear system again. Um, now, this is the best possible. This is tight. For this, for this result. Um, uh, there's a figure that should show up. Sorry, there. That's what the Dickin walk looks like. Now, let me go back here. Um, this, uh, so a generalization that we got a couple of years ago uh, is that, in fact, it mixes in n new steps where new is that parameter of, uh, of the barrier function. So instead of the Dickin ellipsoid for the log barrier, you can use any barrier you want. And if you have a better barrier, you get a better bound and so on. So in particular, Using a weighted log barrier, you can get n squared steps. You can get quadratic number of steps for mixing, regardless of how many facets there are in your uh, defining your polytope. Okay. Um, curiously, the KLS conjecture implies that the universal and entropic barriers are both also going to give you this quadratic rate. It's just a, uh, now here's an open question: Does this weighted Dickin walk we proved quadratic? But as far as we know, it could be linear. And we don't know that. Whereas just Dickin, the MN is tight for weighted Dickin. When you use a weighted log barrier, it's possible that it's just linear. We, we don't know the answer. Okay. So then we, we see we're still back to quadratic, right? We're still at quadratic. And the reason, again, is the same. It's a step size. We can't make these ellipsoids too big. Even though you have this ellipsoid here, you actually end up taking a step from an ellipsoid that's about a one over root n scaling down of it. Because if you take bigger than that, what happens is that the, the, the ellipsoids change too much and the probability that you make a real step becomes too tiny. So you end up hitting this one over root n bottleneck again in a different form, okay? So you change an M to an N, but you're back to quadratic. So um, we found out about this method at a Simon's workshop, actually a workshop for which I was the lead organizer but I never heard of this method before. But, and, and then we, we found out this beautiful method from physics, been around for a long time, uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And uh, what it says is that rather don't take straight line steps. You're using local geometry already. Why do you have to be so brutish and do these discrete changes? Make a, make a continuous step. You know, if the local geometry is changing continuously, your step should also be a curve. Why should it be a straight line? Okay. And so what it says is you pick a direction V and then you're going to move in that direction according to an a differential equation, which preserves some function. What function? In physics, the normal function is some potential plus kinetic energy type of thing, uh, fx plus half v squared. But you can do this with local geometry. And so you can do this uh, with a general metric. So g here represents some metric. It could be the Hessian for barrier, for example. And, uh, and you get uh, this as your Hamiltonian. Using just that setup there, you get to preserve the Hamiltonian as you move. And now you pick a random direction each time. You've got this walk now. Will this give us a chance to take bigger steps, bigger than this one over root n, right? And so just to make sure the, the, the process is clear, at the current point x, you pick a random direction according to the metric, the ellipsoid given by the current metric. And then you move, not in that straight line, but according to this ODE, which is like a path in some manifold, okay? Okay. So uh, the answer is yes, you go below quadratic. You can, uh, provably, you can take steps, still polynomial, but it's one over n to the one third now, it's a fruit n, okay? Uh, so, and um, each step is still a linear system. Now for the log barrier with this method on, on the cube, turns out you only need polylog steps. And this is the first method to need polylog steps on the cube. The cube is easy to sample, so that's not a challenge problem. 
but uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So was that three minutes, Joanne? Yeah. Okay. Great. So um, uh, here are some questions related to this. Can we use dynamic data structures to reduce the per step cost? Totally open for sampling. It was great. It's, it's been it's been a very successful optimization. Uh, uh, not at all clear whether it's helpful sampling. What's the best metric to use, and what's the right KLS conjecture in this manifold setting? Okay, uh, in practice, it turns out that you always have constraints AX equal to B. So uh, one can adapt the method to this. The reason I'm putting this up is because of the theory versus practice thing. Uh, you get a very practical algorithm. And so whereas in theory, I already sketched this uh, current state of the art. Um, this, this is the state of the art theory. In uh, practice, you can go to this uh, sampler, it's, it's publicly available, uh, and try it out. And uh, you can go literally up to a million dimensions and sample it. It's now been incorporated into the systems biology package called COBRA, which is used for these large metabolic systems analysis. And uh, uh, you, you know, it, it performs uh, orders of magnitude better than, than, than the previous methods that, 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 that take local steps straight, straight out um, on a variety of benchmark data sets. Um, yeah, if you have trouble, it's, it's the right way to say it is crunch. So, yeah, okay. okay. Um, anyway, uh, so here's a model they built for this. This is a, 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 a you know, huge number of reactions in metabolites. Existing packages either don't work at all or, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, they can't handle constraints. And you can actually run it on your laptop or my laptop. Okay, so um, the last view point to talk about is uh, the view that let's 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 go back even more really sampling is optimization in the right space okay so this is also a view that came partly out of berkeley so this paper by jordan kindle and otto otto and 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 popularized by Wibisono, that langevin diffusion is in fact gradient descent you see how similar those those steps are so we're talking about purely continuous methods the first is gradient descent the second is langevin diffusion but you're in the space of measures, so you, you, each point is a measure, and your target, your objective is relative entropy. Okay. Uh, how about using local geometry? You can use Riemannian Langevin diffusion, and you get a similar such process. Uh, I will skip this. Um, it's a very active field. Many results here. There was a Simon semester uh, uh, last year. Um, uh, but and and finish off with. Uh, the KLS conjecture itself, on which there's been tremendous progress, uh, resulting in, 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 in all these fast algorithms. And uh, one could ask, does it matter? You know, now log n versus constant, besides being mathematically nice and implying a bunch of dimension dependent constants, here's a concrete TCS reason. The KLS conjecture implies certifiable sub Gaussianity, which means that you get SOS proof, sum of squares proofs of moment inequalities for log concave densities as opposed to just uh, uh, Gaussians. This was in the work of uh, Kotari and Steinhardt. And um, yeah, so, so getting a constant is very important. Log means you still get an end to the log type algorithm as opposed to a polynomial type algorithm. Um, uh, are these equivalent? Does certifiable sub Gaussianity imply KLS? I don't know. But up to log, it's trivial okay. because it implies thin shell, and thin shell is within log of KLS. Okay. Uh, I'll conclude with one conjecture. Um, made, made with Lovas a long time ago, I don't know exactly when, it would imply the KLS conjecture. And this is a combinatorial conjecture, it's almost combinatorial. For any isotropic convex body and any decomposition of it into cylinders, you give me an arbitrary decomposition of the, into cylinders, what do I mean by a cylinder? It's just something that has a small cross section and one axis, any, any convex cross section. A constant fraction of the cylinders must be short. So it's not possible to take a convex body and break it up into cylinders so that uh, uh, most of them are long. You must have a constant, and that implies KLS. Okay, uh, I'll stop here. There's a bunch of nice questions one can ask about what to do, but maybe this is my favorite. Do you even need randomness to estimate the volume of a deterministic, uh, of, a, of an explicit polynomial? Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, here's the meta algorithm, sorry. <laughs> uh, find the right space, find the right path, find the right discretization. I made this slide just in case Manuel showed up, but he's not here, but I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, thank you.
Yeah. Make sense. Should, oh, okay. Thurn, question back. Why wouldn't I hope for? Sure, I hope for it. Um, there are, uh, uh, how should I put it? Um, technical, diff sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So instead of the end to the two third, uh, what about the proof for, uh, like obstructs you from going to root n, let's say? Right. That's so we have to bound a certain curvature tensors norm. And uh, all the methods we know how to bound it don't let us go beyond n to the two thirds. So is, is that the reality? I don't know. As far as I know, you, you could do much faster than that. Any other questions? So just to be clear, I think um, it, since it's being recorded, let's wait for the mic just so that it gets captured. <laughs> So I want just to clarify the last slide and probably one of the slides in the middle of the talk. So uh, in the middle of the talk, we say that KLS conjecture has been solved. No, and up to log n. Up to the log conjecture n. is that it's, uh, it's a, the isoperimetry exactly. for okay. any log concave density is an isotropic log concave density is an absolute constant. So uh, can you repeat again what is happening? Oh, um, so you presented that uh, there are some specific consequences if we achieve n squared. Uh, so, if we achieve constant, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so what one is happening of them, right now that we have the, the result up to a logarithm? Yeah, so up to logarithm for the purposes of the analysis of algorithms, uh, instead of quadratic, we get quadratic times polylog for sampling. So, so maybe that's not so important. But uh, for, uh, for this uh, result that I mentioned about uh, uh, clustering mixtures of uh, distributions uh, using the sum of squares approach. Um, it's important that uh, you establish proofs of these moment inequalities. Higher moments are bounded by a certain function of a second moment to the power of power of this moment with a, with, with, with a sum of squares proof. And so what uh, Kothari and uh, Steinhardt were able to show is that it's not, it's, it's in fact turns out to be quite, quite, quite a simple proof now um, that the KLS conjecture implies that you get this uh, certifiable sub-Gaussianity for arbitrary log concave distributions as opposed to just Gaussians for which we know. And now that we have it until log n. Doesn't uh, give us anything because the running time would be n to the log to the five. Oh, okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, if that's it, then um, let's thank Santosh again.